Hey everybody, Q Brownstone from Planet 5D. I'm here with Dan May from Black Magic. Dan, good to see you again. Yeah, it's been a short three months from NAB, but here we are again. Here we are in New York City at a Black Magic event, and behind us we've got the Ursa Mini 4.6. Very obviously interesting camera to so many people. There are a bunch of questions that we have for you, Dan. Let's get into it. Sounds good. The big thing is, I think some people will think that this is the 4K sensor that has been expanded on, and it's not. This is a whole new sensor that's been developed for this camera, so it's not like we've taken another camera and we've added in the highlights and the shadows. It's a full new sensor that has the available 15 stops of dynamic range, obviously. That has to come from somewhere, but it is a whole new sensor. I think that's where part of that confusion comes from. I think the other confusing part that comes up is we've talked about the fact that it has the ability to do the global shutter or the rolling shutter, right. and it becomes a very difficult online to put specs up and explain it very well. And it's the rolling shutter where you've got that. So it's the rolling shutter where you're doing the 15 stops, the dynamic range. When you do the global shutter, it should, I think, fall into the 13 stops or so. And I had a brilliant engineer explain to me how this all works. I am not that guy, um, but there's, you know, there's, you know, we're not those guys, but, you know, there's a way that we're able to kind of, you know, physically own and choose and make the sensor kind of do what we want it to do there. And then, which is great, it's a great option for a user because if I'm saying, look, I'm doing a corporate event where I want to go and do this outside headshot, I'll take the extra dynamic range. I'm not looking the camera around past there. Or, hey, I'm going out and doing some kind of sport or car or thing. I can go ahead and go into the global shutter. I'll give up the extra couple. Well, it's really interesting because I prepared, uh, I went out onto the web to a couple of my filmmaking groups. A lot of people are just coming back again. I experienced them all as buy signals. These are people who are in some cases thinking of keeping red, in other cases are thinking of coming up with DSLRs. And so they're asking them very specific questions like if I've got 15 stops of dynamic range, what am I exposing for? Am I exposing yeah. for their eyes or the shadows? Okay, so to be determined. Yeah. There are another uh, set of questions that have come in around uh, problems that black magic cameras have experienced in the past. You sure. just said this is a new sensor. Yep. The questions that have come in are around the fine pattern of noise, yep. the uh, black sun, the infamous black sun, uh, and IR. Yeah, I mean, there's some challenges there, and it's a, that is also a masking challenge that you have when you get those black sun things. It's something we're able to update in the pocket, and we haven't gotten to on the 4K sensor yet. Kind of one of those two minutes where you think can or will be able to be updated, um, but it is basically a masking job once it's somewhere you think. Um, which is why you can kind of, like in some cases, you can do it in the Beijing, it's kind of a little more challenging. That can be problematic. Um, but we know on the 4.6 sensor, we don't. We have that licked already. Like we, we have gone out, we've done the couple of footage that I was talking about, specifically had him go shoot it, and I thought he shoot it. Well, on the 4.6K sensor. On the 4.6K so sensor. I don't want to. 4.6K sensor, no more black sensor. So that, that we've seen. So, again, when we get to shipping production units, everything will come out in the, in the wash, as they say. But so far, it seems like the 4.6K sensors don't have that. Now, the FPN challenge. Fine pattern noise. Fine pattern noise. That was a particular thing that we experienced in the 4K camera because of largely a part of our own kind of QA and development process where different sensors were being, again, much better engineering enhancements elsewhere. But essentially, in the building of the products, if they were cleaning up or when they were being calibrated, and that was largely an internal thing that we were able to fix to be able to get the 4K cameras to have a, a, a not aggressive fix pattern. All cameras have some amount of fixed camera. Uh, fixed pattern noise, uh, but we were able to eliminate what was kind of a, uh, we launched that camera, we would see a variable amount of, well this person's camera has a lot of fixed pattern noise, when it turns on, but then it goes away. And then the next person's camera has no fixed pattern noise, but then it comes on when it's warmed up. And this was because of a calibration issue that we internally kind of had as we were building these cameras. Again, long camera manufacturer, three and a half years, we learned a lot of things as we go as well. That largely got improved, we put a new process in place, uh, we did some new internal cooling uh, on those cameras so that 
I would like to largely call that fixed. Well, the camera does have a fixed pattern noise on there, but it's not the aggressive or the wild. You put 10 cameras down and you see the differences there. So that was a particular thing with that build on the production cameras and working in cameras. Largely resolved to a greater degree. Don't expect to see that on future cameras because that's more of a must knowing part of our development and build process that we've improved over time. So, again, hopefully that all comes on the wash, but. July, yeah, that's like a week away right now. So, yeah. so the reality of the situation is obviously we work very hard to get all of these products out on time. We are aggressive in all things we do, whether it's pricing or ship dates. Um, it is definitely looking like this is going to fall into the later part of August at the least for shipping. We know there's a couple of bits that we're trying to work out both in the software as well as a few parts that seem like they're just kind of being troublesome to get into the factory. So. I'm anticipating that what we'll see is towards the end of August, we'll start seeing some of these camera parts come out. Now, we've long kind of internally dialogued, and I think publicly spoke about, and it's very likely that we'll start seeing person mini 4K start shipping, and then we may see the 4.6K sensors shipping as upgrades for current person people, and then we'll see the 4.6K version. There's, like, you can see there will be a little bit of rollout here, and as opposed to like, you know, third week of August comes out, here's a thousand of those, and then two thousand of those, and ten thousand of those. It's, it'll it's be, a natural. It'll be a natural rollout between a couple of these different line items we have in the camera price list, but clearly we're not going to make the end of July, which is a week away. We know there's some parts that are going to be coming kind of the early part of August. Uh, few little small software things are going to tighten up, but it's feeling like end of August rolling into September for the delivery of this work. All right, thanks for that. As far as other dates are concerned, Resolve 12, fusion from that. Yeah, so, that? so Resolve 12 is probably just days away from getting a public beta out there. And our public betas are quite good. They're very solid. So I'm anticipating that people will be downloading that in the next couple of days or weeks or so. Um, I feel very confident about that. Fusion needs more work. Uh, and there's a number of things that we have to, you know, there's individual developers and teams for those products, but they also share UI design, QA department. So Resolve has kind of taken the lion's share of that. It's obviously a product we've had out and shipping has a lot of anticipation. Fusion does as well, but it's kind of in the back of the Resolve pipeline. So Resolve, days away. Fusion needs more time. Not exactly sure what the ETL is, but you know, hopefully in the next couple of months we'll see. Great. We're almost getting to putting this boy on my shoulder, but a couple more questions before we do that. Internal neutral density filters. Is that yeah. likely common? No, uh, that's not something that I think that we're going to do, and it's been talked about a lot um, internally. Obviously, we've had a lot of customer feedback on that. Um, but the gut check is that that's something that we're not going to do. You can never say it's there. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the part of the pro con way out of that, obviously, there's a cost involvement on there, and there's say how many people actually want them on a cinema style camera. And there's not a right or wrong answer there, but uh, ultimately I think the decision of you know, we want to build this camera, we want to have people be able to add those as options, and there's pros and cons of doing that, but it's a bit of a cost, a bit of a performance, uh, and a bit of you know, how big is the certain market that we're talking about having it. So. False color. Yeah, I mean, it's again, one of those like, what do you develop and what do you not? You know, we'd love to put everything into every product, and you know, then we're going to be really late, and it's going to be more expensive. And so, you know, those are some of those, you know, some of those are some of those decisions that are constantly talked about internally. What do we want to do? What do we want to add? You know, it always goes back to the we'd love to have everything, but if we had everything, it would be. An Aria Alexa, which is an amazing camera that people can already buy. That's so great. there's you know there's some realities of the situation. If you're trying to build a three thousand dollar amazing camera, that, you know what do you do and what do you not do? So I, I lied. I'm going to ask one more question. Sure. Then we'll put it on. Perhaps the thing that I've got most feedback on is what is the actual total cost of the ownership? You know, it doesn't come with the hand, or it doesn't come with the battery mount adapter, or the plate adapter. Batteries, and you use a CFAST two parts, can you use CFAST one part? But 
it changes the fundamental price of course. the machine. But I think you have a philosophy about that. And I'd like to yeah, we definitely, I mean, all, all cameras, as with most products, have a cost of ownership that are not, that are beyond the typical SRP of buying it off the shelf, right? Yes, you can buy a V-Box with a little handle for $3,000. About 2% of the population will use it as such. Most will add batteries, add shoulder kits, add EDF, or, or, or some mix and match of that. So when you talk about total cost of ownership, we can say, look, it's a $10,000 package out the door with add a lens and add all that. But uh, people basically know it's not $20,000 because I'm going to go off to my external recorder or I don't need the EVF or I have various, I have lenses and bits. So it becomes very difficult to talk about the total, total cost of ownership. But, you know, I'm very careful. We'll have, you know, a school is a great example of when we come out with the URSA last year, we'll have students come to us and they'll say, would you be willing to donate an URSA to us? And part of me says, well, I would love to donate an URSA to you. Are you aware you're going to have to spend, you know, two or three thousand dollars on seed fast cards? I don't know what you think about that. You, know, you may have the lenses, but you have the seed fast card, you have the battery, you have it. There is a extra cost of ownership of having a product. That's no different than most other cameras and products you have. And, and it's nice with them that by decoupling all of these pieces, you really are making it easier for people which were already in this form uh, or function of the size because they've got a lot of people, they've got the monitors, they've got the yeah, it's just, when you, A lot of the philosophy that you see throughout Black Magic, there's two kind of big tenets that you see throughout our product line. The number one is that you want to have things kind of be on the part, right? When you look at our switches as an example, we don't put up-down converters on all of these. We expect people to use cameras that are similar, but if they need an up-down converter, we sell those, they come add it. If we had an up-down converter on every channel, it would get expensive. We see the same kind of philosophy on the cameras, and that keeps the cost of entry at the very least as low as it can be. Because we're constantly challenged by trying to create the best professional product with the high quality that we can, but it's something that you could only be put a four in the right? So how do you create that price point and that performance product? It is something that a you know 40-year veteran in the film industry can say, this is an amazing product that I want to use, but a first-year film student can say, Look, that's not much more than my Apple laptop. I could go and get that cost of ownership on the side. That's a constant challenge that we're trying to address, and that's a very there's a reason why not many people can do what we're doing here because you know these aren't super high volume, these aren't you know action cameras that are going out by the you know billions. You know, we have to make sure that we're price performance wise threading that line, and that's a very difficult thing to do, a bit harder thing to explain. So. <laughs>it's a relative thing, right? When you put it next to an Ursa, it's, you know, probably half the weight, yeah. and that's quite noticeable. But when you just pick it up and put it on your shoulder, as compared to maybe one of our cinema cameras that's been rigged out for a shoulder rig, like, well, it's kind of equivalent in that when you add all of these things on, it adds weight. So it's not like taking a DSLR and putting a handle on it in the shoulder pad. Like, that's quite light at five-ish pounds. So this is this is still got some weight to it here. Um, you know, but are you going to really keep the battery on? If you're going to really run and gun with it, are you going to put the battery on your belt, lower the weight there, put a beam with it all day. So. And a heavy piece of glass, a beautiful size piece of glass. Yeah, I mean, a brick piece of glass, obviously, it doesn't have any zoom <laughs> zoom, zoom on it, so, you know, maybe this isn't the run and gun style that you would use, but different people have different needs. I can say that this really does feel rock solid, the, uh, the grip and the extension on it, is very, very clean. I'm going to give it back to you and ask sure. one or two questions about that. So, uh, as far as the grip itself, and the extension, let's just turn this around. Uh, does it extend or? So, this, you know, again, this is the NAV unit that we have here. So, when you buy the camera, you get the body and you get this handle, which goes up on, on this guy here. Right. For the $300, $295 uh, price, you get the arm extender, the shoulder lock 
and the handle here. So it's just a nice little kit to be able to have. I know that we've talked about a couple different mini versions that this may be. Um, currently, this version is just a one, you know, it's this many inches it's apart, all. one size fits all. You can adjust that. Um, I don't anticipate us suddenly becoming an accessory company. We have not done it in the past. We kind of do the, here's the accessories we're launching with it, and then we'll let the third party open market kind of take care of the rest. So, um, and of course, the EDF is its own part. A number, of people, a number of people have their own things. They'll be very happy with theirs. But for eight hundred dollars this is a true, like, great display, very bright, uh, lots of adjustments on there. So I think that there will be uh, quite a desire to have that be added to both the Ursa and the Ursa Mini. Well, Dan, there are a lot of people who want to see this. I'm feeling guilty, guys. <laughs> so I'm going to say great to see you again. Good to see you again as well. Dan May, Black Magic, again, Hugh Brownstone from Planet 5D. Speak to you soon.